transitioning out of our neurobiology as it relates to disability unit and moving on to disability rights and also our universal design project which is going to be focused on looking at how we can make our own school more universally accessible. So this morning I have Vince and Ben. They're with the Center for Independence for people with indivi uh, for individuals with disabilities. They're going to talk a little bit about their organization, what they do, and also about disability rights this morning. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Um, my name is Ben McMullen. It's noted. I grew up with cerebral palsy, so that's really why I entered the field of disability advocacy to kind of fall back on experience and advocate to make the community more accessible for people with disabilities. So in addition to going out and giving community presentations such as this, that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I work alongside the um, government at all levels, from local to federal, and I do just that. I work on policy issues to make the community more accessible for people with disabilities. Hi, my name is Vincent Lopez. I'm the Assistant Technologies Coordinator for Center for Independence of Individuals with Disabilities serving San Mateo County. You all have to remember that. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Our name is very long. Um, what I do is um, if somebody has a disability and they have a task that they need done, it's my job to find a way to make the task happen using any sort of assistive technology out there. Um, I've been doing this for three years. I came out of the automotive industry. I was a bicycle mechanic. I was a car mechanic. Um, I have done customer service. I was a sample coordinator for Levi's. So I've done a lot. Um, but assistive technology is really fun. It's a lot of learning. And uh, you're always learning something new. And you're, my, my thing is thinking outside the box and trying to do things as simple, as inexpensive as possible to help individuals get their tasks done. So in a nutshell, I do all the boring work, and Benson does all the exciting work. <laughs> yeah, I get to cruise wheelchairs and stuff. <laughs> so, what we're going to start out is, um, you know, what does the word disability mean to you? And what does the word independence mean to you? Does anybody have an, an answer for that, or an opinion, or an idea? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, well, oh, there we go. I think disability is like not being able to do a certain ability. Oh, independence. And independence is um, not being dependent on other things outside of yourself. I was gonna say independence meant that you didn't depend on anyone else necessarily. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. But it's like that, so. Well, thank you so much. We're gonna do a little background of of uh, the of what we do as the Center for Independence. Let's go back a few slides. Okay. So CID's mission is to, of course, advocate for people with disabilities. We do that in various ways. We provide supported services. So people come to us, um, want to know, have different tools or different ideas about how to be independent. And we provide them with those supported services. We also lend um, systems change and in individual advocacy to make the environment more accessible for people with disabilities. And we um, do all this and build community awareness so people with disabilities can live more independently. Okay, the CID is one of 28 independent living centers in California. There's over 400 independent living centers in the country. 
Our private nonprofit, non-residential independent living center was founded in 1979. Uh, the funding comes from a variety of sources, including federal, state, municipalities, and contribu contributions from individuals and corporate donors. The, ma the majority of our board of directors and staff and management have a disability. The CID is created and maintained by individuals with disabilities for individuals with disabilities. What we do is basically to break down the mission is we listen to the community, what they need, we'll come up with strategies to support their independent living, um, give them resources to utilize so they can bring that independent living out of themselves and be active contributors to society. In the community. And how do we do this? Peer counseling, we do housing accessibility modification. So if you have anybody in San Mateo County that you know that needs their house modified, we go through and work with um, each different city to get funding to go through and modify people's homes. So we'll put in wheelchair lifts, stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, things like that for individuals who need them and can't afford them. Um, most individuals who have disabilities um, are usually low income, and if they qualify, it's all covered. So that's one great thing that we offer. That's our housing modification assistive technology, what I do. Independent living skills, like how do you cook with a disability? You know, how do you do um, like life skills and things like that? Navigation, getting around. Uh, information and referral. We are not the experts on everything, so we will and give people information and refer them to the professionals on there. They know more than us. We help with transition. That's uh, getting people out of institutions and out into the community. Um, that's huge for us because we want individuals with disabilities to be out in the community and in the world with all of us. Um, independent living planning and support. System change advocacy, Ben. Uh, we have a youth program, uh, or youth organization, financial benefits counseling. So a lot of times if you're working and you have a disability, if you make too much money, you can lose your benefits, your medical benefits. So we go through and make sure people do not lose their medical benefits. It's really expensive. Um, and personal attendance services. So if somebody needs a caregiver or a person to come in and help out, we help connect people with um, support systems like that. And if I can add one more thing to transition, Vincent nailed the first part, but the second part to transition, whereas we help people prepare for um, post-secondary life, so whether that's going to school, whether that's joining the workforce, just to make people, give people with disabilities whatever skills they need to explore life after after school. Okay, so in the 70s when, the, uh, when an individual by the name of Ed Roberts, who was, we'll touch on later, was one of the uh, pioneers of the independent living movement, and about in the 70s, there was really a shift in thinking about people with disabilities from a medical model to an independent living model. And the medical model viewed persons with disabilities as people that needed to be fixed to fit into society. Whereas the independent living model said, no, that's not the way we should view things. We should fix society so people with disabilities can be integrated. So there was a heavy focus on professionals know best, uh, mainly medical professionals, when I say professionals, not trying to put the medical profession down, because both my parents are in the medical or were in the medical profession but just the way people with disabilities are viewed and then the 
disability movement came along and changed that model, saying, no, we need to address societal, societal barriers. And we did that and formed a more self-directed approach, thus the independent living model, where it was person-centered rather than ever anything else. And we needed to listen to the individuals with a disability in order to make society work for them. You guys already saw that one. All right, today we're gonna to try and fit 50 years of history and advocacy into maybe, what, half an hour now? <laughs> so, well, there's a, there's key figures on the, we're gonna cover the key figures on the disability advocacy, Ed Roberts and Judy Human, Section 504 Rehabilitation Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Olmstead decision, and also the IDEA, but you can't say it's act because the last part of the A is act, so I can't say it. IDEA act. <laughs> that A stands for act. So, name two pioneers of the independent living movement. Does anybody know two pioneers of the independent living movement, even though we said their names like five times, maybe by now? Just All right, here we go. Just for fun. <laughs> Ed Roberts and like Judy Hoffman or something? I might have got the last name wrong. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna have them reach into the mystery bag and stuff. Okay, as we're doing the mystery bag, you guys are, I don't know how you guys got it. You guys totally guessed it right. You guys have been studying up on disability advocacy. It's great. Okay, well, the father of independent living movement is Mr. Ed Roberts. Ed Roberts grew up in Burlingame, California. So just reach in, grab whatever you want. I know I put a bunch of weird things in there, but it should all. Okay, assistive technology right there, flashlight. Or, so he was going to school in Burlingame. He went to public school. When he was at public school, he ended up getting polio, and he couldn't go to school. So he did all the schooling over the phone. His mom was his greatest advocate. He wasn't allowed to graduate because he couldn't take physical education. And luckily, he advocated for himself, and with the help of his mom, he ended up graduating high school. Well, then Ed wanted to go to college. And when I went to college, it turns out that the college, uh, he wanted to go to UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley did not have any ramps. It was all stairs. They said, where are you gonna stay at night? You have to be in an iron lung. So like, I don't know if you guys know what an iron lung looks like, but it's like a big metal contraption that he had to sleep in. So he had to be in an iron lung and he couldn't get to his classes because there'd be stairs and whatnot, so they'd be limiting him. So he said he created a system where he ended up staying in the infirmary, which is like the local school hospital. He pretty much camped out there, and he set up a system where he would get students to come and help him. And what they would do is, if he was at the bottom of the stairs and he had to get to his class, a group of students would meet him at that time, pick up his wheelchair, and get him to his class. This caught on and it got really big. So a bunch of individuals with disabilities started going to UC Berkeley. And that's why Berkeley is uh, the pioneering uh, place for individuals with disabilities. So he created a whole support system for individuals with disabilities and they were calling themselves rolling quads because they were quadriplegics and they were rolling in their chairs. So that's, less of, so that's my little backstory with him. But he also, so from this template he had, he ended up creating the first independent living center in Berkeley, which is the Isle Berkeley. The Department of Rehab told him he would never work, or D-O-R, told him he would never work. He ended up becoming the director of the D-O-R from 1976 to 1983. So he really changed the system and he changed how the individuals looked at people with disabilities. Um, he was a leader in the 28 days Section 504 sit-in in San Francisco and he co-founded the World Institute on Disability. Ed is awesome, and he's local, so that's what's even better. Next, we have Judy Heenan. She was another pioneer of the independent living movement and a leader in Section 504, which we'll touch on later. 
Um, she was originally denied her teaching license because she was a teacher in a wheelchair and therefore defined by the school system of New York as a fire hazard because they didn't know how to properly evacuate Judy or have her evacuate in the midst of a fire. So they labeled her a fire hazard. Um, she sued the school system in New York because of that for her rights to get a teaching license and she was victorious in that court battle. Um, she founded Disability in Action in 1970, which is a organization that works on advocacy and policy. She was the a deputy director at the Center for Independent Living. She, as I alluded to, she co-organized the 503 sit-in. She was also the co-founder of the World Institute on Disability. So for a, and she also served in the Clinton administration under President Clinton. So for a person that was denied her teaching license, she ended up being quite successful, don't you think? She just had to have people realize it by asserting her rights. Okay, so has anybody, have y'all talked about the Rehabilitation Act of 1973? Anybody want to take a um, stab at what it means? Anyone? A, a oh. guess? Um, a guess. I should have used that terminology. Educated guess. I'm, I'm guessing that it means that, it, that certain institutions or establishments must um, account, like, account for people with disabilities. Um, yes. Something like that. Yeah, you nailed it. So it's, it's stated that any program or service that receives federal funds funded by the federal Assistive government technology. must be accessible to people with disabilities. So yeah, absolutely, that's right. Okay, let's go. Uh, but this, but the Rehabilitation Act did not become did not become in effect easily. There was much protest. Uh, people were adamant against it because they thought the Rehabilitation Act would cost too much to do to make buildings and facilities and programs accessible to people with disabilities. So we're going to walk you through some of the activism that made the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 come to fruition, <laughs> made it possible. So this is a timeline that we have with the Rehabilitation Act on there. So the American Coalition's Assistance of Citizens with Disabilities, the ACCD, everything is an acronym these days. Um, they went through and they wrote a letter to Joseph Calvano and they said, Hey Joseph, if you don't do anything by a certain day and a certain time, we're going to act on this situation because we have to get this Rehabilitation Act signed. So this Rehabilitation Act opens all federal buildings to make to mandate them to have ramps and accessibility for individuals with disabilities. So if you're blind, deaf, have a physical disability, or in a wheelchair, you had no access to any federal building, so you couldn't go to court, you couldn't go to the DM. Well go to the DMV, you can pay your taxes, anything where you had to go to a federal building. So this was huge for individuals with disabilities. So Joseph California, I mean Joseph Califano refused to sign it because he didn't know how to enact it. They passed the law, but they didn't know how to go through and set up all the rules for the law of how it's gonna go through and what's gonna happen. So the individuals with disabilities got together and they decided to do a sit-in in the federal buildings in the United States. And 
and these are some pictures of individuals with, so this is the little flyer that they had for Tuesday the 5th. This is the Hugh office in, on Fulton Street in San Francisco. And then this is a person that was uh, really big in making the, the movement happen, and he was also a Black Panther. Do we have a question? I just wanted to ask, do, do people know what a sit-in is? Can somebody tell us, volunteer and tell us what a sit-in is? I saw a hand right there. It's where you sit somewhere and demand something that you don't eat until they give it. Got it. There you go. There you go. Nah, get something else. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's cool. Okay, so. The sit-in started, so they decided to go to Seattle, San Francisco, Denver, Dallas, Chicago. Individuals with disabilities grouped up together, all different disabilities, and decided to sit in in the, in their, in the offices of Hugh. Um, so they ended up sitting in. None of them lasted more than 24 hours except for San Francisco. San Francisco ended up lasting, I think, 28 days, I believe? 28 days. So you had individuals that needed oxygen, you know, were, needed food, needed services, and pretty much they got support from the local community. Um, was it the Black Panthers went and supported, the Vietnam veterans went and supported, they went and brought food and supplies for people. I think even Jefferson Airplane, the band, they ended up coming out and hanging out too and supporting the, the movement. And so real quick, that's what we call a coalition of folks. If they were allies in the community that wasn't necessarily affected by something like re the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, but they wanted to join the disability community in support of the disability community obtaining their rights. So that's what we call a coalition when people come come together over common causes to support one another. And it turns out they ended up meeting with um, Judy Human in Washington, D.C. and um, from the sit-in, and I don't know the other representatives, but Judy Human's kind of the big name. Boy, Ben Roberts there as well. And they went through it, met with them, and they finally signed it and enacted it. So now all the federal buildings are accessible. So if you go to a federal building and you see something and you don't see a wheelchair ramp or an elevator or something like that, bad. But, you know, so that's what it ended up um, enacting on there. And it was a huge movement and it was a huge win for individuals with disabilities. So the next thing we're going to address is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And this act was enacted in 1977 and it said that people with dis students with disabilities were entitled to a free and appropriate education. So it also went as far to implement rules that Oftentimes, or in some cases, uh, it's appropriate to tailor certain curriculum for people with disabilities to make accommodations rather than anything so they can receive adequate education that similar to what their peers without disabilities would also And how do you think this education look for the implementation of IDEA? Any, um, yeah. Get your prizes, those are important. Not good. Not good. That's a good answer. That qualifies. Grab a prize. probably didn't let them like go like be in the same room as them or 
like gave them the same education and probably made like thought that they weren't as smart or something like that. Yeah, why are we even here? Nonsense. I know. These students are great. They know it all. Mm -hmm. Grab some mystery stuff. <laughs> Again, it's all like a little bit of assistive technology. Well, I'm guessing people with like extreme learning disabilities, but they would think they'd have to go to a different school. Like, um, otherwise, people with like smaller disabilities would still try to go to the school, but then they would still have some issues as well. You're right, they would fall in between the cracks, and uh, in individuals that, yeah, had a uh, more on the spectrum or higher spectrum disabilities, definitely. Whoa, okay, we're gonna do two more. I know, we'll do, okay, let's just go. Oh, oh. Uh, let's not forget that it's not just learning disabilities, but all kinds of disabilities. It's, yeah. it's like people yeah. who might be crippled or have- Oh, you can't say the C word, bad word. Oh, That's okay. Who might have uh, physical disabilities. Phys physical disabilities, <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Yeah, nailed it. Um, oh, you grabbed them. You want. Uh, before the hacker desk, they were kind of a little bit neglected when it came to education. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming that they weren't very accommodating and the disabilities, they just sort of lost over there. Yeah, a lot of kids fell through the cracks in the system. They didn't get the same rights as the regular kids in the yep. school, or like this, like the same respect. Okay. Yep, you got it. Okay, we're going to stop it there. Yeah, we need that. Because i got to flip the next slide. <laughs> I know, I know, I was thinking of you. I know, it looks like it's nothing, but you can do many things with it. That little piece of rubber. Five minutes, okay. So this is kind of what it looked like when kids were in institutions. <laughs> I didn't mean to go extreme on there, but... Many individuals uh, lived in state institutions for people with mental retardation. You can't say that's a bad word, too, um, or mental illness. In 1967, state institutions were homes for almost 200,000 people with significant disabilities. Many of these restricted settings provided only minimal food, clothing, and shelter. Too often, persons with disabilities, such as Alan, um, were merely accommodated rather than assessed, educated, and re rehabilitated. Could you actually talk about what the preferred words are? Oh yeah, that's going to be on our disability etiquette presentation, okay. the next one we're having on there. Okay. Okay, so quick question. we got to speed it up a little bit. But throwing out a question, what does the ADA mean to you? Yep, in the front. I think the first A means administration, but I'm not actually sure about anything else. Network. Okay, no. no. Well, it could, it could apply to administration. Yeah. I think it means, and like it stands for American, uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, I think. There you go. It gets a prize for sure. Okay. Um, I think. Like what pass. Ben said, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. You got it. Or, oh, we got another um, one? I got an extra one. I grabbed it's, two more. Um, or it could be um, accessibility, dis accessibility Disability Act, but probably American. So, yeah. yeah, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. But it encompasses everything everybody needs. So, um, Everybody wins. All right, here we are. So this act was signed by George W. Bush, but it took a lot of advocates to bring that forward. One advocate was a gentleman by the name of Justin Dart that went around the country and he collected stories of how people with disabilities were having trouble accessing society. And he used those stories to advocate to get his friend, the president, to sign the supportive pieces of legislation into law. 
why is 1999 an important year for disability rights? I don't know, if you guys read the picture, we're being subliminal with you. Why? Okay. Sure, but wasn't there like old homestead got like a court case passing favor? Oh my god, this is great. Yes, exactly. So, two, two people with disabilities were um, had a lawsuit in Georgia suing for their right to live in the live in society rather than an institution, and they appealed that decision up to the Supreme Court and finally won and it said that people with disabilities have the right to live in the least restrictive environment possible. And I heard that you guys were doing something with Ruth Ginsburg, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she announced the decision to the court on June 22nd, 1999. She stated that the Supreme Court answer was a qualified yes to the question of whether ADA's prohibition of discrimination by a public entity required placement of persons with mental disabilities in community settings rather than institutions. And this is just a glimpse of legislation that we're actively working on the day to pass. Um, the first one I share was there was an effort to dilute, um, which means to take away from the ADA and give notice of rights before you can implement them. And we were successful in getting that piece of legislation blocked. And the other one is um, here in California for people with mental illness and substance use disorders. Uh, and those are a couple of the pieces of legislation that we have been advocating for and against uh, for people with disabilities in the state of California and nationally. And just where do we go from here? It's all about uh, getting out having presentations such as these, seeing what people with disabilities care about, and seeing how we can promote and further the independent living movement to support the rights of people with disabilities. Okay, um, today, uh, 7-8 Girls Basketball. 